Okay, here's a problem that I have been asked to do. Uh, you uh, can read it for yourself. The question here is to determine what kind of problem this is. Uh, do we need a free body diagram or not? Uh, and so uh, you uh, look to see what it is that they're asking you to find. They are not asking you for a force. And therefore, it's not a dead giveaway. We're not sure. Uh, what you have to do is count the degree of freedom. So you ask yourself, is there something that can be that is moving? The answer is yes, the crate is moving. So you count one. Then you say, all right, stop the block from moving uh, it'll, it'll, you know, down that incline. So if you stop the, the block, you ask yourself, can anything else move and not break, fall apart, go limp, uh, or violate the, the conditions? And the answer is no. If you stop the crate, and it does not slip on the belt, then the belt has to stop also, which means there are no more motions. So if you hold one motion, then everything else stops. No matter how you count the degree of freedom, it has to come up to the same number. If it doesn't, you're doing something wrong. That would be a time to stop and think about what you're doing wrong. For example, if you also are trying to count degree of freedom, you could say, is something moving? Yes, the belt. So you count one for the motion of the belt. Stop the belt from moving. Can anything move? No, because if the crate moves and the belt is stopped, then it's sliding. And the problem says it is not sliding. So if you stop the belt, the crate stops too. Therefore, there's still one degree of freedom. Okay, what does that mean? It means if you have one, it means you're going to have to find one acceleration. If you have one acceleration, then you don't need a free body. If you don't, then you, you need a free body. So read the problem. Do they tell you one acceleration? The answer is no. They don't tell you an acceleration. So therefore, you need one. One is needed. And you are given zero. Because these two do not match, you have no choice but to draw a free body diagram. So we have to do a free body diagram. So you ask yourself, should you draw the free body of the belt? Should you draw it of the crate? Should you draw it of both? What should you do? Well, if you think about that, that belt, there's a whole bunch of rollers. There's all kinds of outside things touching that. I do not want to draw that. So I'm going to try the, the box. So this black... Uh, right here is the uh, is a free body diagram of the box. So I uh, look for these invisible forces. You have gravity. Is it drawn? It's an inside outside uh, between them. So yes, you draw it. Then you look for contact. The belt is touching the box. So it has a normal force and it has a friction force. So I label it as F. Now, this is static friction. It is not sliding. Static friction is always less than or equal to mu S n. Sorry about the pause. Anyway, because friction is static, friction is less than or equal to mu S n. We don't know what the number is. Maybe it's zero. Maybe it's mu S n. Maybe it's half of that. We don't know. So because I don't know the number, I'm going to put it in as a variable f. And uh, so I draw the arrow. Uh, if this box is going to slide, it's going to, because you're stopping the belt, the box is going to have a tendency to skid on or slide on down this way. So the, the slip is, if it has any, that would have a tendency to slip downward. Friction opposes that, and so therefore friction goes up. And that's why I draw the black arrowhead up the incline. Okay, so those are the forces that are acting on that crate. What do you do after you sum or draw the free body? You always sum forces. The question is, in what direction? The answer is always in the direction that makes the acceleration easy. So think about the motion that this thing is going to have. What acceleration is it going to have? 
it's slowing down. So it's going to be a deceleration. If it's slowing down, the, de the acceleration is opposite the velocity. So therefore, the, the acceleration is going to be upward. So we know that the acceleration is going to go this direction here. So that'll be the acceleration. Pretty sure of it, because it has to slow down. Therefore, I'm going to choose uh, this direction up the incline to be positive. Call it x if you want. And then I'm going to choose, this one doesn't matter so much. I'm going to choose uh, perpendicular and upward to be the positive y direction. So those are the two directions that I've chosen. So what I then do is I come over here and write these blue equations. The first blue equation right here is the uh, sum of the forces in uh, along the conveyor belt, in the positive conveyor belt, positive x. So you have F, the friction. Uh, you have uh, mu, or excuse me, mass times gravity times the sine of the angle 30. Uh, F is positive because it's going up the incline. Uh, the gravity is negative because it's going down. That's equal to mass times acceleration. I don't know which way A is. I'm going to say, hey, I think it's in the positive direction. Of course it is. We've talked about that. That's why I put it in as a positive there, but that's the, the positive. Okay, second equation. Second equation is the sum of forces uh, perpendicular to the incline. So you have n minus the uh, component of gravity. It's equal to zero because it's not accelerating perpendicular to the incline. If you now count the number of things you have unknown, I've highlighted them in yellow. I have friction, I have acceleration, and I have normal. That's three unknowns, and I only have two equations. I cannot solve for three unknowns with two equations. There are too many unknowns. There's got to be something else that we know. Either it's an impossible problem, which isn't happening in this class, or there's something that we don't that is given that we're not taking into account. So what you do is you reread the problem, and it says it wants to find the shortest time. The shortest time to stop something would be the largest acceleration. If you wanted to to you know stop quick, you want to accelerate. Uh, a large amount. So what you're looking for is the largest acceleration. The largest acceleration, if you look at the first equation, the largest acceleration would occur when the friction is largest. Because the m and the g are constants, there's nothing you could do about that. So if you get the largest friction, you will get the largest acceleration. So therefore, what he's telling me is he wants the F to be large, as, quick, as big as possible. Well, it's less than or equal to mu Sn. So the largest friction is mu Sn. Therefore, based on what he's telling me and asking me, I know that friction is equal to mu Sn. This is oftentimes called an impending motion problem because what it means is it's about ready to start slipping, uh, but it's not. It is about to slip. Anyway, it's called impending motion if you need a, a name. Okay, so now I have three equations. I've got the two that I've highlighted here, and then I've got this one here that tells me what the friction is. Therefore, I have three equations, three unknowns. It's solvable, uh, not a big deal. Okay, let's go ahead and solve them. I would like to have A. Why? Because when you're doing dynamics, the key is to get your A's. Okay, so I want the A. I want the acceleration. If you want to solve for something, you want to leave it into the equations as it, for as long as possible. That's why I choose the second equation and start picking on it. So I take the second equation and I solve for the normal force. That's easy. Normal equals mg cosine 30. That's what I've got right here. Then what I do is I'm going to take the normal and I'm going to put it into the first equation. <clears throat> or excuse me, I put it into the, the friction equation right here. So friction is mu s times normal. So uh, this one with this one, the first one, gives you mu s times the normal that's the friction, minus mg sine, th sine 30, that's this second term, equals mass times acceleration. 
right? So that's where that one comes from. It's a combination of the third and the first. Then if you notice, there's a common mass, so you can cancel it out. Oftentimes in dynamics, the mass will cancel. So if you're working a problem and the author doesn't give you mass, don't panic. It probably disappears. But anyway, it cancels. Then what I do is I just gather everything together and I solve for the acceleration. And that's what I get here. So it's just a little algebra. You can, I'm sure, do that yourself. Okay. Now that you have A, what do you do with it? Well, is this a time spanner? Yes, it is. They're asking for, they give you, it's working at, or moving at four. After some time goes by, it has stopped. So this is a time spanner. The way you handle time spanners is you integrate. What do you integrate? You integrate the acceleration. So I want to integrate the acceleration. Is the acceleration constant? Yes. G is constant. Mu s is constant. Cosine 30 is constant. Sine of 30 is Everything is constant. So yes, A is a constant. Because it's a constant, because it's a time spanner, I'm trying to integrate. I use the handy-dandy formulas. Because he tells me velocities and asks for time, it looks like this, this one would be a handy one to use. So I write it down, and then you plug in. At the, at the final uh, time, uh, the velocity is zero. It has stopped. At the initial one, the initial velocity is minus four. Why minus? Well, because I chose upward as positive. Therefore, it's moving down. So it has to be a negative four. So, if you, so that's a negative four plus the acceleration times time. Solve for time. Pretty simple. Time is equal to a positive 4 over A. Okay? Now, just plug in your value for A, which you have right here, and uh, you get the, the, the solution. I don't have a calculator, but it should be easy to do from there. That's the, that's the solution to that one.